question is very simple. Did Thomas then uh, personally know Jesus rather than most of the Gospels were written 100, 200 years after Jesus was on the earth? Well, you're making an assumption. And perhaps you might remember in the 150 images I showed you that it's, it's really important not to have preconceptions when you're seeking something. The fact is that they were not written 100 or 200 years afterwards. We know from scholarship that uh, Mark uh, was around 40, uh, that the latest one was John, written around 100, and that this, which I have just shared with you, was also around 30 A.D., the very source of those. So Thomas is doubting Thomas, indeed, one of the 12 disciples. So he knew. He knew and suffered his shocking demand to put his finger in the wounds and then became the first to say, my Lord and my God. Knew so much about Jesus, he must have been very close to him to be able to quote so many of his sayings. You know, there's a reason why there were 12 of them. At one point, there were hundreds of them, and they all left him. In fact, in John, Gospel of John 6, 66, after the multiplication of the bread, and Jesus speaking of being the bread of life, most of his disciples left him, it says in the text. So those Twelve were indeed deeply initiated into his teachings. And much of that has been uh, sort of watered down uh, and broken up and fragmented. We've forgotten about Mary Magdalene, who was the apostle to the apostles. There is lots that we don't know. I mean, think about what has just happened here, friends. These words that go back to the beginning, that scholars have proven predate the earliest of the four Gospels, was not found until 1945, waiting all this time, and then not published. And now today, for many of you, it's the first time ever you hear such strange words. But they're strange words because they have a depth to them that we're not used to. 50% of the Gospel of Thomas can be found in the other Gospels. And then there are these other words. And what is important to realize is what an astonishing phenomenon this is. If you buy the book, you can read the story of the two uh, young Arabs who found uh, the Nag Hammadi texts. Uh, they took it back to their mom who was really happy because she used some of them for kindling the fire. <laughs> Ouch, that hurts, doesn't it? And then finally it found its way in spite of all obstacles to this place now where we can see it. What does that mean? The spirit is alive and well and continues to manifest. If it was all locked up back in 347, then we'd be dealing with a closed book instead of an immediate reality. Here we learn that it is about our own personal immediate encounter and transformation. And it transforms everything. It shows us that for two millennia, the church got it wrong. Every time it did not have the Christ-like spirit. When John Calvin sits by and lets his opponent be burned alive, I say to you, he missed the boat. That is not the Jesus we recognize. And the institutions took on secular ways. And the Protestants came along and the Lutherans became more Lutheran than Luther and fragmentation everywhere. It's a disaster. We're at the tail end of Christianity's influence on the world. And just at this moment, here this appears. I say to you, it's no accident. There is purpose here to bring humanity that is resonant to these ideas, back in line with what it was really all about. 
The churches are emptying everywhere. People are seeking in other religions because they don't know this. They don't know the true power of this world teacher. I saw a hand go up right there. In uh, essence, most of what was found at Nashamadi was found in a jar. Some of that was found in a dump, I guess. Um, do you take any particular meaning um, that these documents were lost for 2,000 years, uh, essentially? Yes. I know what you just said, mm -hmm. uh, but... It was a what, reason why it waited so long. What's the purpose? Why on earth? How did they get into that jar, and why are they now out of the jar? Isn't that wonderful? Why are they now out of the jar? That's a marvelous question to contemplate for contemplative gospel. Well, let's put it this way. Human beings from day one started damaging these holy teachings. Peter versus Paul, right? The Church of Jerusalem versus Paul's effort to reach out to the Gentiles. It was a mess from day one because we are human. And Irenaeus, whom this morning for All Saints Day we mentioned because he's a grand father of the church, was fanatically anti anything that he didn't consider orthodox. So you have Irenaeus, you have Athanasius, two people with power who decided on their own that you're not allowed to read that book. Now, as a human being, as an American, that right there should bother you. But it is the result of human beings dealing with holy things and making a mess of it. Such a mess that many have fled Christianity seeing the river of blood that it has left in its wake. And that isn't right. Because it isn't Christianity doing that, the Crusades and everything else. It is human beings who didn't get it at all, who never understood anything like that. So the reason for it is that people and their weaknesses constantly destroy what is good and beautiful. You might as well be asking me, why is there conflict in church? Why can't people act as Christians? It is very hard to become more than what we are. I've known people in churches who say, transformation, what's that about? That's not even on the menu, when in fact it's the heart of the matter. And the reason for now is what I said a moment ago, we are at the tail end of Christianity. We all know, many of you were there, in the 50s, it was uh, apple pie, the flag, and Christianity. There were, there were 3,000 members, am I right, here? Or 1,300, I guess. This place was packed. It was huge. Everybody went to church. Now we're hanging by a thread, and it's everywhere. So the timing enables us to rediscover the heart of what is in these teachings, and not to be blinded by the history and mistakes and foolishness of humanity in misusing them, you know, to burn witches and all that horror that has nothing to do with Yeshua and his teachings. It's a new beginning is what it is. It brings people like you who don't go to church into church to find out about it. It's hope for the future. Microphone lady. <laughs> we got our quickest person to do this. Yes, I have go. another question. Uh, do you have any idea what Billy Graham will speak on when he goes on TV, TV November 7th? I don't have, I have not heard that he's going on. I have no idea. And um, I don't really care to answer your question. I mean, we're dealing with truth. Billy Graham is part of that Christianity mainstream 
that would probably say, uh, just like Irenaeus, burn that. Get rid of that. Yeah, he's a good man. I respect a good man of integrity. I have a problem with his black and white theology that comes out of a very limited American frontier idea of uh, literalism, which misses the depths of Holy Scripture. A true Christian, a true follower of Yeshua would probably not be invited to the White House because they would speak the truth to the individual who is president and that would not be acceptable. Hi. Um, you know, it would seem as though it's a bad thing that uh, the Gospel of Thomas was left out of the Bible, uh, but what you're indicating is that the timing is right maybe now for us to see this anew or see it for the first time. Um, do you have a, a vision or a, a feeling for the time being right, right now, and uh, that this is the tail end of Christianity and maybe the beginning of something else, or the beginning of Christianity for the first time? Yes, is the answer. Let me quote B.D. Griffith. Anybody know B.D. Griffith? He was a marvelous Anglican monk who lived in India, a true holy man, a sage. It's amazing how they, they don't, those guys don't end up on television, so nobody knows them. B.D. Griffith, highly respected holy man, uh, right out of the uh, best of Christianity, said that if Christianity does not recover its mystical tradition, it might as well fold up and go out of business. He said that shortly before he died some 10 years ago. And I find that to be profoundly prophetic. If Christianity does not offer human beings the life-transforming spiritual knowledge that it was meant to, uh, then what is it? A social club? You know, why do people run away from Christianity? They see hypocrisy, they see contradictions in behavior. So I believe that we are on the verge of a new birth that we could name mystical Christianity, where people who resonate to the reality of spirit truly join together. Church itself means, as my friends at Northwood know, the assembly of those who are called out. That is to say, those who have that intuitive sense of the reality of God that they devote themselves to, especially in a world that has gone so dark, so dark. Every year, there is more horror on television. Am I right? Just think from 20 years ago. Uh, the darkness is palpable. I had a little girl come to my house for Halloween. Halloween that used to be All Hallows Eve about the saints. And her costume was a severed head. So while she was taking candy, I was looking at the neck of a severed head. And people are okay with that. I say it's madness. So we have been degenerating for centuries now, and we are suddenly in rapid free fall. Rapid free fall, catastrophic free fall. And so if there's going to be an oasis where people can find meaning and the holy and the sacred, it's got to be resurrected. It's got to be brought back like the vision of St. Francis when Jesus says, rebuild my church. So in every generation virtually, but now in a much larger context, we must rediscover the depths of our faith and truly live it in our time. Each individual 
It can't be just handed down in Sunday school. It has to be part of a living, conscious awakening. And I believe it is possible. There is much more interest in spirituality now. All of you 60s friends. Huh? There you are. You know, there was a great explosion of teachings from all over, from places that once were unknown to the West, including Eastern Christianity, which only in the last 50 years has had its great teachings, which belong to all Christians, translated in English. So we are in a extraordinary crossroads right now. Some teachers say, and I've said this before, when the times are darkest, the ray of light shines brightest. So even in this dark time, there is exceptional opportunity to find this. That's the wonderful paradox. In a secular, materialistic, violent, hateful, selfish time, here comes the living words of Jesus. Lighting a fire in a new way. That gives me great hope. That means that those who have turned their backs on the church as social institution, as thing to do, are going to join together again to find the deep teachings that change their lives. I see a hand back there and a hand over here. Where's my microphone lady? Right there. Hello. Can you give me some context as to the time period and the place when, uh, when these were sealed in these jars, these teachings? I mean, what was it like in this part of the world? What was going on? What was the vibe? Uh, if you were a typical believer in Christ, what was your life like? Uh, what could also, what would your motives be necessarily in sealing these things away? Uh, very simple, very clear. Uh, this uh, Nag Hammadi was near a monastery. Uh, and those individuals who loved dearly these teachings had to hide them because the order was given by the bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius in particular, that they must be found and burned. And that burning business is more Nazi-like than Christ-like, wouldn't you say? And in the early, in the first 300 years, Christian communities, brothers and sisters gathering together to share something of this new way of being, all read different materials. And as some of you may know, there was a big struggle about what was going to be the last book in the Bible. It wasn't going to be Revelation. There was another one that Christians loved everywhere that you've never heard of. That's not fair, don't you think? The Shepherd of Hermas, a beautiful, poetic, uh, uh, symbolic book which the bishops gathered together by Constantine voted down. Can you imagine voting down what gave people food for their souls? That's unthinkable now. That's how it was. And so they were hidden because a few courageous souls were not about to let him disappear off the face of the earth so that you right now could find it someday. And we owe them a great deal. We're pointing to somebody here, right next to you there. I um, am familiar with the Nag Hammadi writings and, and um, have followed them over a period of years. Um, I'm wondering when you describe the fact that the Christian church is at a juncture and that 
it will take some event or great events to precipitate uh, a return of the masses to true Christianity. What part do you think that a sudden realization that they are about, the Christians are about to lose their church, their teachings, um, to opposing religious and world forces, what part do you think that may play in this return? I'm sorry to say that many Christians and my beloved friends here, I mean no judgmentalism, are in denial. In our particular case, this church once was had chair, chairman of the board was uh, the governor of Indiana. Big, important, you know, very much in many of these folks here were part of a very different church. We had another church two blocks down, which died. Some of them are here today and suffered painfully over it. We have another church in our denomination on Fall Creek, on Binford, that died back in 1990. It was alive and well. Some of our friends were part of it. Uh, a fabulous minister, Don Jones, was the pastor. They're gone. And uh, as my friends know, uh, we are fighting. And how, how is it going to work? Not the masses. It's always the remnant. Because the masses are not interested in these things. It's going to be the individual spiritual seeker who somehow connects with these teachings. And there's a couple of them sitting right in front of you who come from across town, no longer the neighborhood church, that's gone. That's gone with the wind. So we seek to gather from wherever in the area individuals who value enough transformational teachings to repopulate, to rebuild, and save this place, one church at a time. Those spiritual seekers are everywhere. But most of them think Christianity is the mega church or the fundamentalist church. <laughs> you can take that as some kind of sign. Go right ahead. I know people who, you know, there's a tremendous lack of integrity among the intellectuals who hate Christianity because they'll pick up the worst form of it and call it Christianity and then criticize it. When in fact they don't know the first thing about the depths. And so they aren't even exploring that which they are rejecting. It is extremely complicated, and it is through the grace of the Spirit that one at a time people find their way to places like this where we seek to live and breathe uh, the deep truths that the Anointed One has brought to us and make our lives different and beautiful. But the masses will never do that. They just want to eat, drink, and be merry and miss the boat. The spiritual seeker is a lonely person. And we need to gather those lonely persons together to be companions on the way and truly live something authentic. That's what brings a new day for us. I'm not used to talking into microphones. Um, I have once referred to Christianity as it's practiced, as it has been practiced most of my lifetime, as the biggest brainwash in human history. And my question is, why are voices like this, like yours, why are we not hearing them? Why is it that all we're hearing is the garbage and the lies? That, that's what's on the news. Why is, why is that the only voice? of Christianity? That's a wonderful question. 
and I'm always horrified as to who they bring on to represent Christianity. You know, a good Southern Baptist. I don't know why they have Southern accents uh, with their fundamentalism, but uh, that often is the case, and I, I mean that without prejudice. Um, honestly, I do. I do. Uh, it's just, you know, tradition. It's a tradition of, of the world they grow up in. And uh, people like myself, uh, you know, I've journeyed 35 years to be here, to get to this point. And I'll say more. I had to leave the church to rediscover the church. Because what I grew up in told me nothing of the sacred, of the mystery of life, of the wonder of life. And so I had to go find uh, other teachings and found my way back through people like Thomas Merton, who could so lucidly express the experience of transformation and of prayer and so forth. And so we naturally are few and far between. Um, it is a very difficult process. You have to have, as I've told some friends, rhinoceros skin to do what I do. Because a lot of people don't want it. Even in our denomination, you know, reject the inner life and reduce it to a rationalistic thing. So it is always going to be rare and difficult. And all I can say is the cosmic truth from this holy man, seek and you will find, really works. If you have that purity of motivation, hunger, keep going despite all the obstacles, you will find what you need to find because you will be guided, even if it's a needle in a haystack. Ted, um, what do you see as a place of suffering in uh, being open to these teachings and open to this transformation that um, you spoke of tonight and every Sunday. <laughs> you say, what do What I is the place of suffering in being able to come? Or is there a place? Is suffering one of the things that draws us into this more mystical experience? In other words, what is the is there a role? that suffering plays yes. in that. Yes. Um, don't you remember Logion 78? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got the book, friends. Uh, twice he mentions, blessed is the one who suffers, uh, both for the internal battle and the external battle. There is no question we all know it from experience, that without suffering, most of us remain extraordinarily self-absorbed, unable to have empathy for others. Suffering, though not given to us by God, but by the nature of life itself, matures us, either breaks us or helps us grow. Many of you know I have a wife who is handicapped. Don't feel sorry for me, because it is my opportunity to love more, to give more. And as you may have heard, one of the great lines uh, that was spoken tonight, among others, was, he has given it all already. I... I'll share with you a little tiny anecdote. I had someone who was desperate, and I had a few dollars in my pocket. And the person said, Pastor, I don't want to take your last dollars. And what came out of me spontaneously was I gave it away a long time ago. Uh, I wouldn't be here without going through the suffering necessary 
to shape and build. Uh, someone who can transcend, who can find a deeper self that can transcend their circumstances. You know, it's the famous saying of the sculptor uh, working his hammer on the stone. The stone just thinks it's being hammered. But what's being created is a beautiful work of art. So unfortunately, yes, it is suffering that quite often makes us deeper people, puts us in touch with, makes us realize our need. As long as we don't think we need help from above, uh, we can't even break through. We're self-sufficient, we're okay, but when we're on our knees saying, God help me, there's a humility there that is the foundation stone for becoming a new person, a deeper person. And that turns suffering into light, just like he said. And that is divine wisdom that can do that. Here. Uh, yeah, it's coming through. It is, okay, yeah. Except for real close. It's not just suffering and darkness and conflict because there's so much light and so much love and such wonderful awakening to what is real and true. And it's something that perhaps is difficult to think of then and think of now and trying to put the two together as difficult as it is not to personify what God is. But it's, it is now, and it's, it's a wonderful thing that we can discover and awaken to now. Something that's been sleeping, and we can bring it to life. And it is light, and it is love, and it's a wonder to enjoy. And that's what I get from this church and every Sunday I come here and I listen to you interpret the depth and the beauty of the scriptures, the way it can be lived today and to make my life and hopefully those around me that I touch more beautiful. You know, this teaching is so extraordinary that in becoming transformed by it, in finding your deeper self, I say to you, you can actually heal your past. Imagine that. To reach a place of understanding, of forgiveness and love and light. To know that we come from the light, that we are the light. Can spread through time and impact our past. That's how wondrous this all is. And it is a tragedy beyond words that it has not been taught. So many of my Catholic friends, you know, learn nothing. Their legacy is magnificent. We've got this hospital named after Saint Vincent de Paul, a magnificent saintly man, Saint Vincent. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, countless saints full of light and teachings that the people never hear about. They just go to the ritual. They're given a surface thing, just like in the Middle Ages. It is, it is a catastrophe uh, that has been uh, inflicted upon humanity. And so one at a time, we have to find that light within and without. And it will heal us. And then as you heard, we share it. We receive it, we give it. And it has to be done with discernment, as you heard. Because, don't kid yourself, I'm, I'm taking a chance here, friends. To share this with you. Although I trust most of you are wonderful people. But we could have had someone here with an agenda 
to attack anything that didn't fit their familiar box, right? And see how we were protected from that. So these are important times, and Spirit clearly is guiding us towards a new day. More and more people are needing or hungry for that which the culture cannot provide. And as that occurs, well, look at that. I was going to mention the cell phones, turn them off, and I forgot, and they didn't ring all the way through. Except for now. Protection. More and more people are seeking. More and more people are awakening to the spiritual. And it is our duty to show them what there is here truly. To get past all of the wounds of bad religion. Of judgmental intolerant religion. And doctrine into that which is living and magnificent and recognizable, self-authenticating, as you heard earlier. They recognize it deep in here, that this is right. And I am truly grateful to my friends at Northwood Christian Church, mainstream church, allowing me to give in this way and calling together others who hunger and thirst for the experience of the Holy. We are very lucky.